Hi, this is David McKinster. Uh, this talk is about the backstory of Plato's cosmology. It's an introduction to the section of my intro philosophy course on metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics is the, if you will, theories about reality. What do we mean when we say something is real? Are there different ways of being real? Do we always mean the same thing when we call something real? And epistemology is theory of knowledge. Okay. Once again, what do we mean by saying that we know something? Are there different ways of knowing appropriate to different kinds of uh, known objects? Uh, what's the difference between knowledge and opinion? Okay, Plato's going to have quite a bit to say about all of this. To understand Plato's position on uh, his, his basic framework of metaphysics and epistemology that's revealed in the sun, divided line, and cave, it's helpful to know some of the backstory. What problems were on the table when Plato was writing uh, this section of the Republic? This is, by the way, considered one of the best pieces of literature <laughs> by literary, uh, literary historians who can read it in the original Greek. One of the best pieces of literature in the Western canon. It's also considered one of the absolute bedrock milestones of Western philosophy. So we are not going to begin to plumb everything out of it that can be plumbed out of it, but we're going to look at such features as are important for, uh, you know, for a first look. Um, Plato, like many important thinkers, is the guy who pulled all the individual accounts together and saw what the whole elephant looks like, if you remember that parable of the, the blind wise men. Uh, and of course, in order to do that, generally you have to find a higher perspective that allows you to unite all of those different concerns. Okay, so let's begin. The first person that uh, we should note is Heraclitus. Heraclitus was long before Plato, long before Socrates for that matter, very admired, almost, almost universally admired thinker in the ancient world. Um, unfortunately, we have only fragments of his writings. The upside is that he wrote in short, pithy statements rather than long, extended, connected treaties. So sometimes we have whole thoughts with these fragments, but we know we don't, we don't have all of what he must have taught. Um, Heraclitus believed that you had to make people see things for themselves, be able to say things in their own words. So his teaching methods often involved presenting people with paradoxes or problems that they had to solve themselves. I like to, uh, I like to compare him to Zen Buddhism in more recent history. Zen Buddhism is a, it's a Japanese school of Buddhism. Uh, at least some schools of Zen use riddles and paradoxes that they give to the student in order to try to make the student break out of his old ways of thinking. One of my favorites is about the goose in the bottle, and I'll just tell that now because it always reminds me of Heraclitus. The Zen master says to the student, there's a goose in a bottle. He's too big to get out of the opening, uh, out of the neck of the bottle, and there's no other opening. You have to get the goose out of the bottle. No damage to the goose, no damage to the bottle. How are you going to do it? The student immediately bows and says, the goose is out. Okay, now you're probably wondering, what? <laughs> exactly what is that supposed to mean? Well, think about it. The Zen master says, the goose is in the bottle. There's no opening except the neck, and the neck is too narrow for the goose to get out. There's no other opening. Get the goose out of the bottle without hurting the bottle or the goose. How are you going to do it? The student simply bows and says, the goose is out. Well, ask yourself, how did the Zen master get the goose into the bottle? He said the goose is in the bottle. So, of course, the way to get the goose out of the bottle is to say, the goose is out. The moral of the story, so to speak, is that we can, with our ways of thinking about problems, create scenarios that are impossible to solve. We can paint ourselves into a corner where there is no solution. And the key then is to break out of that way of thinking and reconceptualize what it is we're trying to do. Um, that's very much, very much characteristic of the thought of Heraclitus insofar as we know it. Now, Heraclitus was extremely interested in the importance of change. Most thinkers in the very ancient world were very interested in the phenomena of change. And that interest has persisted into, into modern physics. <laughs> okay. It's, we take it for granted that change occurs, but it's very difficult to actually explain how one thing can, in another moment of time, become something else without simply sort of blurring over <laughs> that conceptual problem. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, 
The problem of change is somewhat like the problem of time, as St. Augustine described it. If some, he said, if someone asked me what time is, of course I know what time is, until I try to explain it, and then I realize I am at a loss to explain what it is. Well, essentially, that's because we're at a loss to explain exactly what change is. Um, Heraclitus understood that, uh, that the notion that everything is in a state of flux, everything is in a state of flux, makes it very difficult to think about the notion of reality. To be, to be, you have to be something. But if you're in a state of constant change, are you any one thing? And if indeed we're in a constant state of change and the world is in a constant state of change, how then can we know anything? He likens that to an archer who is moving, trying to hit a moving target while his bow and arrow are unstable. If he hits that bullseye, it's going to be essentially by accident. This is a problem for knowledge. There's a sort of skepticism about how we can know, how we can know anything on the basis of appearances. Okay, Russell's first chapter in his book is going to be about appearance and reality. Well, that's a very, very old problem. Um, <clears throat> it's Heraclitus who came up with the, uh, with the aphorism, you can't step into the same stream twice. What does that mean? Actually, the whole aphorism is you can't step into the same stream twice, new waters are ever flowing. And for his audience, the idea of flowing water would have been a, a, a very common metaphor for the passage of time. We can't step into the same stream twice because at the second moment, new waters are flowing. You can't recapture the past moment. Okay? A later uh, interpreter of Heraclitus said, the fact is you can't even step into the same stream once because even as you're stepping in, the stream is changing and you are changing. Okay, now we know Heraclitus did seem to think that there were solutions to these problems, but unfortunately we don't have those works. <laughs> if he ever wrote down what he thought the answers were, we don't have those works. He does believe that there is such a thing as virtue, but we don't know how, you know, how that fits into his whole scheme because again, we just literally have a few fragments <laughs> of, of his writings, a few fragments of the scrolls. But many, many other people praise him to the heavens as being the person who, if you will, sort of knocked them out of their lazy habits of thinking about the world, locked, knocked them out of their dogmatic slumbers, and made them start really thinking. So, the I Ching is a Chinese work, and I just, I, mean, I, I oftentimes mention that in conjunction with Heraclitus. The I Ching sometimes is subtitled in English translations, The Book of Changes because an important part of ancient Chinese thought was that we do in fact live in this constantly changing flux, but behind that flux there are patterns, there are principles that are themselves persistent, that do not change. Understanding how the interplay of all these eternal patterns creates the world we live in allows us to either figure out how to live a harmonious life, or if we're ignorant of those, of the, of those principles of change, we end up creating chaos and disorder. Okay, it may very well be that Heraclitus had ideas very similar to that, but that is speculation. Okay, I'm not the first to speculate that that may be the case because, again, this isn't something peculiar to Chinese thought or Greek thought. It's something that you find in archaic thought, uh, you know, pretty much universally. Parmenides has an interesting uh, idea of how to solve the problem of change. He says, in fact, there are two worlds. Parmenides introduces an approach which we sometimes call dualism. Dualism, as I mentioned before in conjunction with ethics, dualism is the belief that there are literally two worlds. Now, Parmenides says, yeah, this Heraclitian flux, which is essentially unknowable because it's in a state of constant change, is the world of appearances, the real, however, is one. It is an unchanging unity, incapable of change because it has all perfections. To be is to be exactly what you are, perfectly what you are. So the real must be one. Now, the problem with dualism is that it generally introduces more problems than it solves, while in the last analysis, failing to solve the problem it set out to solve. If there are in fact two worlds, and this world of appearances is simply illusion, where did that illusion come from? The real never changes. <laughs> where did that second world that is ultimately unreal come from? If it didn't come from, you know, the one. 
Um, and if it did come from the one, then clearly the one is in interaction with the world of illusion. I'll put it this way. If you have a dream, say, you dream that you're in a, uh, in a movie dancing on top of a train car. And you wake up and you go, wow, I wonder why I dreamt that. You were not actually on top of a train car dancing, but you had a vivid dream, okay? The dream is a real dream, even if the content isn't real. If you have a hallucination, the hallucination is a real neurological event, okay? Even if the content isn't real. So if this second world, this world of illusion, is an illusion and its content is misleading and unreal, still, there really is an illusion. Where did that come from? Okay, this is, a, you know, this is a position that most philosophers would say doesn't really solve anything, although this notion of the unchanging, perfect unity that is what is ultimately real, that was, uh, that was an important part of medieval theology. Medieval uh, Christian the theologians drew upon that, uh, that language to try to describe God. And, uh, you know, they, they have the same problems. Well, if this is what God is, how does God actually interact with the world? This doesn't, you know, just doesn't fit easily with a whole lot of the rest of what we want to say about God. So, <clears throat> Plato, um, Plato wanted to be very, very sure that people didn't mistake his theories about universals, which we're going to discuss later, with the ideas of Parmenides. He wrote a dialogue called the Parmenides, in which he has Socrates interrogating Parmenides about this doctrine. Uh, different people interpret that dialogue different ways. Um, you know, for, it never could have taken place because Parmenides was dead long before Socrates, so why would, why would Plato uh, create that particular piece of philosophical fiction? Some people say, well, it's just, just this brilliant piece of self-criticism where he had, grown, he had grown doubtful about his own theories concerning universals. Others say, well, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, who knows what it is? Maybe he just felt that uh, in the end, Parmenides would look, the, the ideas of Parmenides would look better than the criticisms of Socrates. My own take on this, which is certainly within the mainstream, is no, look, Plato, and you know, most commentators on Plato will, will agree with this, Plato is very different in, in his ideas from Parmenides. But if you are too casual a reader, you may very well mistake some of what Plato says for the doctrines of Parmenides. And I think Plato wrote this dialogue, the Parmenides, to make sure that everybody understood, I am not simply advocating the doctrines of Parmenides. I am not a dualist. Plato, in fact, tells us that, he, that reality is not dual. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the divided line. Reality is not dual, but language is necessarily dual, and that's where we get mixed up. Okay? But that's the teaser trailer. We'll get to that later. Pythagoras. Pythagoras is an enormously interesting philosopher. Um, he may have actually been Egyptian. Uh, the Pythagoreans were mathematicians as well as philosophers. They were mystics. They practiced nonviolence, lived in a monastic community, uh, gave full equality to women, which for the, for the Greeks of the time was just utterly unheard of. Um, they apparently were astronomers as well as mathematicians. They believed in reincarnation and they believed that essentially souls are reborn because they are, we have descended from the divine and we are returning to the divine. And so they believed, you know, nonviolence, vegetarianism is a form of nonviolence because we ought not to harm any soul as it struggles to ascend back to its divine source. Um, <clears throat> the, leaving aside the religious and mystical side of uh, Pythagoras, which I do think, and I think most scholars would agree, did have a profound impact on, on Plato. What's important here for cosmology is the mathematical philosophy of the Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans had an interesting take on this. They said, look, if you want to understand, yes, this whole world of appearances is in flux. But if you want to understand what makes it knowable, if you want to understand what's real, look at the general patterns that occur and describe them mathematically as much as possible. And if you can come up with these mathematical models of what's behind appearances, then you'll know what's really real in nature. Well, since we have modern science, we've had modern science for a few centuries, that sounds pretty elementary, but imagine being among the first people in the world to ever think this, to ever figure out that this is the way to go. Plato thinks this is one of the most brilliant ideas ever. 
he will spend a lot of his own career saying that mathematics is indeed the language of nature. If you want to understand what nature is telling us, you need to be able to uh, understand it mathematically. Um, <clears throat> Aristotle had no time for this at all. Aristotle you complained, in fact, uh, you know, these crazy followers of Plato, they want to turn everything into numbers. That's not the way to do science, all these numbers. Science should be about classification, <laughs> right? Um, well, there's a role for that, but certainly, you know, when, when science takes off in the, in the Renaissance, it's because they've rediscovered two things. This notion that uh, mathematics is the language of nature and this hypothetical method that Socrates introduced, okay? Finally, Socrates. Okay, we've talked a lot about Socrates before, so all I want to add here is, first of all, the, 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 the crucial importance of this, what's sometimes called dialectical method, where you make a hypothesis, you hold it up to scrutiny, you go back and revise it if it doesn't hold up, and you keep doing that until you get something that stands up to scrutiny. You stand ready to revise your ideas about the world based on the evidence. Okay? And that's, again, even in our time, that's hardly a universal attitude. Socrates also argues in several places that of the things we can know in the world, the things we can know with certainty are very few. And they will basically be abstract principles. For the rest of what we use to get around in the world, we have reasonable beliefs, and reasonable beliefs are quite sufficient for that task. What makes a belief reasonable? you can explain why you hold that belief. You've held it up to scrutiny, you can give an account of it, and you stand ready to revise that belief if the evidence shows that you ought to. Okay? And that, he says, gets us through this world of appearances. This gets us through everyday life. The additional thing that Socrates offered, the revolution, in fact, part of the revolution he created in philosophy was to say, you know, all this speculation about what's real and how we know it's real, all of that, that may be interesting to some people, but he said, there's only one thing I think that is a really important philosophical question, and that is how we ought to live our lives. If we are speculating about the nature of knowledge or the nature of reality, and that helps us to eliminate misleading answers to the question, how ought we to live our lives, or helps to open doors to figuring out how we ought to live our lives, all well and good. But all this abstract speculation has to be brought back into everyday life to help us live our lives, or else what's the point of doing it? Okay? That has a profound impact on Plato. I, I think some, some people who have an incomplete or, uh, I, I think, to some extent, mistaken understanding of Plato forget that he is always very much the student of Socrates in this regard. No matter how far into the heavens Plato's mind soars, he always brings it back down to earth and says, okay, now what are we going to do about it? Okay? So, <clears throat> Plato's solution to pull together all of these, all of these, this whole problem set, if you will, is what Russell refers to as universals. Now, sometimes you see that translated as Plato's theory of ideas. That's totally misleading, although etymologically uh, the word idea is close to the Greek word. Um, an idea is something that exists in your mind. If somebody wasn't thinking of an idea, it wouldn't be there. That's not what Plato's talking about. The word form is sometimes used. That's a little less misleading, but when we say form in contemporary English, we tend to think of shapes, okay? Well, remember, by the time you're hearing this, you've, you've completed the logic section of the course. Think about logical form, okay? There are formal truths that have nothing to do with shape, right? Shape is just one kind of form. And that's, that's closer to what Plato's talking about. As uh, Bertrand Russell points out in his book, The Problems of Philosophy, on those two chapters on universals, he says that, in fact, most contemporary philosophers would be talking about these problems, they would use the term universal. And I think that's, that's a less misleading term, simply because we have, have less baggage attached to it. So what exactly is a universal? Here's the breakthrough idea. If you have only two categories of being, mind and matter, that limits the kinds of answers you can give to any question about knowledge or, or reality. If everything that is real is simply what's, whatever is material, then 
it's very difficult to account for what we would call abstract general truths, the truths of mathematics, the truths of logic, even uh, the more general truths of science. If on the other hand, everything is mind, that means that, uh, you know, essentially things exist because we think of them. <laughs> if everything that's real has to be either a material object or a mental object, then essentially it's a figment of our imagination or it's something, it's part of this world of flux that comes into being and passes away. There is where the problem occurs. Plato's insight is that general abstract properties, or if you will, universals, are every bit as much of the real world as ideas and material objects. In fact, even more so. Okay? What is a universal? Well, what color is the tip of this, of this marker? Not a trick question, you'd say red. <laughs> okay. What color is this ink? Not a trick question, you'd say red. So there's some literal sense in which they are the same color. Well, yeah, you can see that. Uh-uh, no, actually you can't see that. Your eyes don't see sameness. Your eyes, your, your brain, if you will, collects the data of sensation and your brain organizes it. It is your mind, your intellect, that recognizes sameness. Okay? What shape is this? It's circular. What shape is this? Circular. What shape is this? Circular. Are they literally, in some literal sense, the same shape? Of course they are. And we wouldn't think twice about saying they are the same shape. Is any of these a perfect circle? No, if you can measure it closely enough, a circle is defined as a closed curve in which every point is equidistant from the midpoint. And leaving aside the problem that mathematical points don't have material extension, don't even worry about that for now, but if you could measure this minutely enough, you'd find, no, it's actually, actually it's irregular. Well, couldn't we make it more regular? Well, up to the limits of our technology, yes, but then if we could measure it more, oh, you know what? We're finally going to get down to the level of molecules, in which case the whole idea of surfaces is gone. So how is it we see these abstract general properties, such as circularity? And we see them repeatedly in many, many, many objects. This is what Plato's understanding. What makes things intelligible to us is that particular objects, such as this cup, participate in or embody or, you know, somehow manifest to us abstract general properties. They only do it temporarily, they only do it imperfectly, but we're able to see these abstract general properties through them. Um, <clears throat> how do you know there's a cup here? I tell you when I have a live class before me and I ask that question, how do you know there's a cup here? I see everybody kind of squirming and looking away like, you know, I'm, I want to tell them I can see it, but I know that's an ambush. But no, it isn't an ambush. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly why you would say there's a cup here. I can see it. I can not only see it, I can hear it. I can taste it. I can smell it. Well, okay, what is it that I see? Let's just start with vision. What is it that I see? Colors and shapes and the relationships between those colors and shapes. Okay, colors, the kinds of things that uh, can be shared by many different objects at once. Yep. Our shapes. Yep. Our relationships. Yep. So in other words, I know there's a cup here because my, my mind recognizes a, conca a concatenation of universals. Without that concatenation of universals, I don't know that there's a cup here. I don't perceive the cup. And you know what? Without that concaten concatenation of universals, that convergence in an orderly way of universals in space and time, temporarily and imperfectly, without that, there is no cup. That's all particular objects are, is a particular convergence of a set of universals in particular relationships to one another in space and time, which means it's something that comes, that concatenation comes into being and passes away. And it is not a perfect example of those universals, but it is enough to, if you will, direct the mind's eye, as Plato puts it, to see those universals. Now, as Russell points out, we don't normally think about particular objects in terms of their universals because we're just in the habit of taking 
what's going on behind the scenes for granted. When I'm looking for a particular cup, I probably want to drink something. I'm not thinking about, how do I know there's a cup there? But if I stop and ask that question, all of a sudden, you know, the doors are open and I can see a whole lot about the universe. Okay? Abstract general properties or universals are in fact the key to our ability to know anything. The key to why things are, in spite of this flux in space and time of things coming into being and passing away, why things are intelligible. Okay. Um, <clears throat> David Hume, a philosopher who I'll mention a number of times, was uncomfortable with this idea that things we can't sense, non-material things, could in some literal sense be real. In fact, real, uh, you know, <laughs> turbo real, if you will. You know, the redness, redness itself doesn't come into being or pass away. You know, this, uh, you know, the redness of this cap will, and it's not perfectly red. It's not even entirely red. You can see little discolorations in it. But it's red enough that I see it, I can you know, recognize redness. So Hume, like many modern thinkers, wants to start with sensation and say, you know what? Now, Russell talks about this. You, you may remember it from the reading. I don't need the notion of universals. If I say, look at a red rose, we'll just say that's a rose rather than a tulip. If I look at a red rose, what I'm doing is I'm using, I'm using that rose as an emblem in order to organize around that emblem a whole bunch of other particular objects that are similar to it. I don't need general abstract properties to do that. I just need a bunch of uh, particulars that are similar to one another. Well, as Russell points out, Hume has kicked universals out the front door and snuck them back in the back door. Excuse me? A bunch of particular objects that are similar? What does similar mean? It means they have the same properties. Uh-oh. Uh is similar a relationship that is consistent between those different rows? Okay, okay, okay. We didn't get rid of universals, did we? Now, if you're still sitting back and saying this just seems implausible to say that abstract general properties are a real part of the world, or in fact are real in a, in, a, in a more robust sense than particular material objects are. Now let me ask you this. Have you ever seen the law of gravity? Really? What color is it? No, I mean you see objects that are falling. We look at a bunch of falling objects. <laughs> we do controlled experiments and we come up with abstract general properties that we call laws of nature. And we say, you know what, that law of nature, the law of gravity, is real in a more robust sense than any particular falling object. Oh, gee, I guess. Okay, then in that case, in that case, once again, we may not have looked at it, but we're used to actually seeing the world in this way. If I have a circle and I begin to uh, deform it, I am not destroying the nature of circularity or inventing the nature of triangularity. A triangle has always been and always will be just exactly what it is, independent of any particular material triangle. A circle, circularity if you will, will always be and has always been exactly what it is, irrespective of any, uh, any particular material circle. What I'm doing is I'm deforming this material object such that it embodies circularity less and less and triangularity more and more. How could I even know that unless the notion of circularity were constant and the notion of triangularity were constant? I would have no way to consistently apply the words over time. What this means is that abstract general properties, while they are displayed by things that are in space and time, they are themselves outside of space and time. They are not within space and time. Therefore, they are not subject to change Therefore, they are not subject to imperfection. They just are exactly what they are. Okay? Um, referring again to medieval theologians, they kind of went nuts over this stuff when they, when they discovered it during the medieval period and said, wow, you could change a few words and turn Plato into a Christian. In fact, by, that, by the time they were reading it through St. Augustine in particular, Platonic philosophy had so influenced 
Christian theology that, in fact, the reverse was true. You could change, you could change a few words and turn a, quite a bit of Catholic theology into Platonism. Okay? Which is not to say that they're the same thing. Okay? Uh, Augustine was a brilliant man, brilliant philosopher, but uh, I personally think he got Plato wrong on a, number of, on a number of points, and I'm not alone in that opinion. But, you know, the fact is, the fact is that these ideas have influenced our thinking in lots and lots of ways that we're probably not even aware of, okay, until you start investigating. So, Plato, when he starts talking about the metaphor of the sun, okay, he wants to distinguish between knowledge and opinion. Now, let, me, let me illustrate something to you. Circularity is a universal, yes. Triangu triangularity is a universal, yes. And so forth and so forth and so forth. Those are both shapes. Is shape a universal? Yeah. Is it more general than circle or triangle? Or circle or triangle? Yeah. There are more, there, if you will, there's an ascending, ascending pyramid of generality. Okay? Shape is one possible type of form, and so forth and so forth. Plato gives us some hints about what this would be like all spelled out. A philosopher, Neoplatonist philosopher such as Plotinus, who was uh, uh, an important interpreter of Plato, but also a very important religious mystic, uh, a, a Ro an Egyptian who lived in Rome most of his life. He, he spends his whole philosophical corpus, if you will, spelling out exactly how this pyramid goes, which Plato did not. Um, <clears throat> this notion that there is an ascending pyramid, if you will, to finally get to the highest universal, that is at the core of the divided line in the metaphor of the sun. Plato wants to distinguish between knowledge and opinion. Okay, again, that's, that distinction is at the bottom of, uh, of much of what he's doing. Knowledge requires truth. If there aren't truths to know, there is no knowledge. Truth requires reality. If nothing is real, there's nothing for the truths to be truths about, and hence no knowledge. There's a sort of completeness to this very strong uh, interpretation of knowledge. Now, Plato actually uses a half a dozen different Greek terms to talk about knowledge versus opinion. We're just kind of, uh, we're just kind of simplifying that. Knowledge requires truth. Truth has to be of real objects. And there's a kind of completeness. The mind has apprehended how the world actually is, unmuddled. And this requires understanding. I have an elderly friend who likes to say, don't ask me how I know, I just know. And of course we you know, kind of chuckle about that because <laughs> it's one thing to, to have a very strong opinion, it's another thing to actually know. Knowledge requires understanding. It's paradoxical to say, well I know something, but I don't understand what it is I'm saying, I just know it's true. Um, well, one can be very confident, but one can also be babbling when one is very confident. <laughs> okay? Opinion, on the other hand, only requires conviction. It doesn't require truths, it just requires that you're convinced about something. Convictions don't have to be about anything real, they can just be about whatever appears real to you. And opinion is a matter of degree. I can hold opinions strongly, I can hold them less strongly, I can hold them sort of flimsily. And they don't require understanding. They only require that I be persuaded. I can be persuaded of things that I don't really understand because of that emotional element of, of persuasion. So this distinction between knowledge and opinion uh, is, opinion would be appropriate to the realm of, to the Heraclitian flux, to the realm of comes into being and passes away and is known primarily through the senses that we're trying to make order out of it. Okay? It's imperfect. It's, it's impermanent. And so we can only have limited 
understanding of it, that means that it's the realm of opinion. Our knowledge of universals, on the other hand, would be complete, and that's where real understanding would lie. If you were to put a spoke or an axle or something right here and turn this over so that this is on the bottom and this is on the top, essentially you've got the distinction between the upper and lower parts of Plato's divided line, which is what we'll talk about next. Okay.